I recently accepted a job as the new sheriff in a small town called Hollow's End, making me the only law enforcement officer within a hundred miles. As it turns out, this decision may have been a huge mistake. Normally, a job like this one in a little town with a couple thousand residents would mean a pretty boring and mundane existence. I've worked in a few different small towns over the years, and I was expecting this to be more or less the same. At first, it appeared that mundane was exactly what I would see. Besides a few speeding tickets, I didn't run into any real trouble. There was Randy, the town drunk, who often slept in the police station's only jail cell. I picked him up on a nightly basis for starting fights or disturbing the peace, vandalizing businesses or screaming bloody murder while walking the streets. He was typically alone in that cell, which he often called his apartment, although there was room for ten or more in the big cage. Every so often, he'd end up sharing it with someone who'd been unfortunate enough to cross his path and lacked the common sense to avoid him. The town had your typical problems, shoplifting teens and the odd disputes between neighbors and spouses, but for the most part it was peaceful and quiet, and the jail cell remained empty, aside from Randy. It seemed that most people in Hollow's End resolved their differences privately, without resorting to calling 911. But I've come to realize something since starting as the new sheriff in Hollow's End. Despite the similarities to other places I've been to, this town is not like other towns. There's something very weird about this place, and I can't put my finger on what it is. The residents have been welcoming and friendly, don't get me wrong, but at times I feel like an absolute outsider. Like there's some secret I'm not privy to. During town hall meetings, for instance, I'll make suggestions or ask questions and everyone goes quiet. Like they're in on some big mystery that I don't know about. People whisper and shoot glances in my direction, then go quiet when I look their way. I know. This must sound paranoid to an outsider. But that's what I feel like I am here. An outsider in Hollow's End. Anyways, I thought maybe getting some other people's perspectives might help. Maybe you can see what I'm missing here. Maybe you can help me figure out what's really going on in this place. Today started out like any ordinary day. I was sitting at my desk in the bullpen of the police station doing a crossword puzzle and listening to the baseball game on the radio, waiting for some action. Like I said, not much happens in Hollow's End. But my experience told me that some people would be out raising hell on a warm day like this one. There were sure to be a few drunk and disorderly calls, and maybe even a DUI or two. Randy, the town drunk, was locked up in his cell as usual, snoring away. I'd picked him up in the wee hours of the morning, and he had ranted at me for a while before passing out. It had been more than eight hours now, and I was planning on waking him up soon to kick him out, starting our daily routine all over again, when the red phone rang. There was a dispatcher who put the calls through to this phone, and if it didn't pick up after three or four rings, it flipped over to my cell phone. I nabbed it just in time before it switched over. Hello? I said into the receiver. This is the sheriff. What's your emergency? Will you shoot that fucking rooster already? Randy screamed from his cell so loud I couldn't hear the person on the other end of the line. After this outburst, he promptly began snoring again. Sorry, can you repeat that? 
I asked. Uh, hi, a timid voice on the other end said. Is this the police? Yes, this is Sheriff Parsons. What's your emergency? The woman sounded confused, as if she did not realize who she was calling or why. Hi, yeah. Um, uh, look, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't have called. She was about to hang up, and I pleaded for her to stop. Hey, if it's an emergency, then you dialed the right number. What's going on? The woman hesitated and sounded uncertain, but I tried to convince her to trust me. Listen, I might sound annoyed, but that's mostly just because you interrupted me in the middle of my crossword puzzle. And Randy's really getting on my last nerve. But actually, I'm really anxious to get out of the station. I can come by and talk if you want to explain in person. Whatever it is, I might be able to help. Sure, she said finally. I'll give you my address. I hung up the phone and immediately filled a nearby bucket with cold water from the bathroom sink. It would only take a minute, and whatever the woman was calling about didn't sound that urgent. I really didn't want to leave Randy alone in the police station. He was good with picking locks, and who knew what sort of hell he would raise if left alone in the bullpen. He'd gotten out of that cell more than once, and I had no idea how he did it. This way was just easier. Wake up time, Randy. I said, opening the cell door, freezing cold bucket of water in hand. What were you saying about a rooster? Because I actually need to replace mine. Ten more minutes, he yelled angrily. Then he opened one eye and saw the familiar bucket of water in my hand and shot to his feet. Uh, you know, on second thought, I'm good. I've learned my lesson. Can I go now? Several minutes later, I pulled up in front of the house. A young, pretty, brown-haired woman stood at the front door, holding it open. She held up her hand and waved at me timidly. I walked up the driveway and stood on the front porch, introducing myself to her as kindly as I could. So you're the new sheriff? You're, You're new to Hollow's End as well? I nodded. Yeah... I've been here for just a few weeks. It's nice. People have been very... welcoming. Mostly. When did you move in? Last summer. She answered. Her lip trembled and there were tears in her eyes as she tried to speak. But her words caught in her throat. Whoa, hey, what's wrong? Are you all right? It's my husband, she said. He didn't come home from work last night, and he isn't picking up his phone. This isn't like him to be gone for so long without calling. I don't understand what could have happened to him. I I don't know if maybe they did something to him. Slow down, I said, pulling up my notepad. What who did to him? Is there someone out there who has it out for your husband for some reason? She shook her head, clutching herself and looking past me with nervous eyes. Her neighbors were just getting home, getting out of their car with a load of groceries in their arms. Hey, Christine. The man called over to her. Everything all right? Great. She called back with a fake smile plastered across her face. Miss, what's going on? I asked, confused. Do you think they might know something? No. Maybe. I don't know. Listen, the only one in town who I trusted was the old sheriff, and he's... Well, you know. And I don't don't know who to believe. This place. We had no idea when we moved here that it was like this. Did you? I shook my head slowly, trying to figure this woman out. Well, you'll see. Everyone who lives here finds out soon enough. For us, it was the garden. We thought we knew better, but we found out quickly enough that you have to follow the rules in this town. And one of the rules is, you don't talk to outsiders. I'm sorry, but I think that's what you are still. An outsider. I opened my mouth to say something, but 
She was already retreating back inside. Who's the old sheriff? I managed to get out. The door was almost all the way closed, but then she paused and opened it up again. Just wide enough for her to say one name. And it was the last name in the world that I would have expected. Of course, the one time I actually needed Randy, he was gone. The man was constantly raising hell. And residents of Hollow's End were always complaining to me about him. But now that I needed to speak to him, everyone was going radio silent. Further proof of the conspiracy, a paranoid voice in my mind said, but I inwardly silenced it. I drove around town in my beat-up old cruiser, trying to spot Randy in one of his usual haunts. He wasn't sleeping in the ditch in front of the liquor store. He wasn't in the forest in the fort he had made out of fallen branches. He wasn't in the washroom at the gas station. And when I went to the playground and looked at the monkey bars, there was no sign of him there, either. It was like he had completely disappeared from the face of the earth. I was about to give up looking for the time being when I finally spotted him, walking along the shoulder of the road up ahead. The man had long, scruffy hair down to his shoulders, an untrimmed beard which was brown with dirt, and he wore a duster jacket carrying a backpack with him at all times. His cold blue eyes had always looked intelligent to me, and I had thought ever since I met him that he was smarter than he let on, even if he was also completely and utterly insane. I pulled the car over and got out, but he continued walking straight past me, ignoring me. Randy, I called after him. Hey buddy, listen, I need to talk to you about something. He pretended he didn't hear me, continuing to march forwards. Hey, man. I'm sorry about the bucket. It's just, you're like Houdini. I can't leave you alone in that cell. You get out every time. It's it's really hard to wake you up without it. He didn't say a word, so I just kept talking. Fine. I get it. You, you have every right to be pissed off. Maybe I should just consider changing the locks. Something tells me the old sheriff might still have a copy of the key to that prison cell. That finally got to him. Randy stopped walking mid-stride and turned to face me, a little grin playing at the corners of his mouth. I have no idea what you're referring to. I clicked my tongue, giving him my best attempt at a disappointed fatherly look. Guess I'll just have to arrest you again and search your bag until I find those keys. Maybe I'll check a few other places, too, if they're not in there. Arrest me for what? He yelled indignantly. For being a pain in my ass, I answered back. Really, I just needed to talk to him. I had no intention of arresting him. I heard a noise over my shoulder and turned to look. But there was nothing except my cop car and the rearview mirror a little ways back showing a reflection of us. When I looked at Randy again, he was pale as a sheet and looked like he'd seen a ghost. He stuck at his wrists, asking me to cuff him. Just do it. I'd rather be in there anyways, especially at night. Ain't safe out here, man. Randy had always said these sorts of things, but now I was starting to take him a bit more seriously for some reason. I put the cuffs on him, but just for appearances. There were a few people watching from the windows of nearby stores and houses. There were always people watching in Hollow's End. Always that feeling of eyes on the back of your neck. You're not under arrest, I said quietly. I just want it to look like you are. I need to talk to you. I drove us back to the police station and tried to interrogate Randy along the way, but he promptly fell asleep and started snoring the moment the car began to roll. I had forgotten that that was one of his quirks. Randy was a narcoleptic, whose spontaneous sleeping fits were often brought on by driving. He was like an infant, soothed by the motion, and lulled to sleep. 
When we got back to the station, I looked in the mirror and noticed he was gone. Feeling even more confused than usual, I opened the back seat to look at the place where he'd been sitting. Randy had disappeared, leaving the handcuffs and several empty bottles behind. Of course, there was no way out of the back of the police cruiser without the doors being opened from the outside, but that hadn't stopped Randy. Nothing could stop Randy. And the son of a bitch still had the spare key to the jail cell. And who knew what else he'd pilfered from the station after quitting or getting fired or whatever the hell had happened. Annoyed, I got into the driver's seat and decided to go out for a patrol to clear my head. Driving always helped me think. I managed to find a picture of the missing man from Night Soil Avenue by pulling up his driver's license through the patrol car's onboard computer system. It was the one and only modern piece of technology in the ancient vehicle, and worked reasonably well. Despite looking for several hours all throughout the town, I didn't see the man anywhere. Through some detective work, though, I managed to find out his employer's name. He had recently started working for J&M Delivery Co., a local takeout food and delivery business in Hollow's End. I resolved to go speak with the owners after a quick pit stop at the police station. I went inside and was somewhat unsurprised to find Randy was already in his cell, with the cage door locked, inexplicably drinking a steaming hot cup of coffee from a mug which I'd never seen before, which said number one sheriff on the front of it. While this was very irritating, it was also the best news I'd seen since finding out the dad bod was back in style. Sitting down at my desk, I tried to think about how to approach this situation. I needed this man's help. But he was clearly insane, and also possessed some sort of Houdini-level magical prowess. His alcoholism was another concern. He was typically blackout drunk at this hour of the day, and it was barely 5 p.m. Get to talking, Sheriff, he said suddenly. It's almost noon, and I haven't had a peep all day. If you don't want me to start ranting and raving, you better get to the point. I let this sink in for a few moments, ignored the urge to check my wristwatch, then asked him a question I'd never asked him before. Why do you drink, Randy? What exactly is it inside of you that you need to drown with booze every day? And what happens if you don't? Oh, you've seen it, Sheriff, he muttered back at me. You've seen the broken windows on Main Street. If I don't drink, those fucking faces show up in the glass every time. They're waiting for me. If I forget to drown their voices, I'll hear them screaming. And you don't want to hear the screams of monsters, Sheriff. Trust me, there ain't nothing in the wild world more terrifying than the screams of your nightmares. Just pray you never hear them. But I think you will. Nah, scratch that. I know you will. And then you'll be joining me in this cell. Drinking right along with me. And they'll have a new sheriff in town. Every week a new sheriff. He was rambling and I tried to cut him off, but he was gone now. There was no way to get through to him except by doing the unthinkable. But luckily I'd gotten pretty good at doing unthinkable things. I went into my desk and pulled out my trusty bottle of scotch and hated myself as I poured him a tall glass of the stuff. Once Randy was good and drunk, he began to spill the beans. And what a story it was. Completely unbelievable, of course, the drunken ravings of a lunatic, but the tale terrified me nonetheless. So this is why you drink? This is why you smash people's windows and run around screaming in the middle of the night saying things are chasing you? He nodded. And you really expect me to believe this? He nodded again. But if you get drunk, you don't see them. He continued nodding as I left the bullpen to go use the toilet. You're an idiot. I said on my way out. You'll see, he said. Probably any minute. I got to the bathroom and did my business. 
and then began to wash my hands in the sink, scrubbing them with soap and hot water until they stung. Standing there in the quiet bathroom all alone, I suddenly felt more scared than I had ever felt in my life. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw a dark shape in the mirrored surface of the glass in front of me. It was too close to be my reflection, too sinister and dark. It was moving on its own, not matching me at all. I didn't want to look up, but I found myself doing it anyway. My heart hammering, I looked into the glass and saw a face that was not my own. There was someone else staring back at me from the glass. Her face was inches away, looking ready to jump out at me. It was a woman. Her skin looked like she'd been poisoned. Her eyes had dark rings around them, and her veins stood out prominently, inky black in color. Her flesh was sweaty porcelain, her gaze vacant, as if she didn't notice me at first. But then her eyes caught mine, and it was like a veil had been lifted between us. And she took me in, her rotten smile growing wider and wider. Black teeth were revealed, and between them where her gums should have been, there were a million spiders, crawling outwards, seeking the light, trying to get out, trying to get at me, skittering and crawling across her skin, moving down her arms and tracing a path toward me. More arachnids began to pour out of her hair and out of her eyes as she held back laughter, holding up her hands to bridge the gap between worlds. Reaching out to touch the glass, it shimmered and turned to water for a second, before changing back to glass again. Wasting no more time, I punched the mirror with my fist, shattering the glass, and thankful that my hand didn't go right through and into that other world. The pain was exquisite, the blood dripping immediately from the wound and running down my arm, soaking and staining my uniform with red. Shards of broken glass could be seen embedded between my knuckles, sprinkled across my skin and driven deep into the flesh in places. Jagged bits of broken glass hung suspended in front of me, some still stuck to the wood where they had once been attached. Pieces fell into the sink, ringing against the porcelain, and I tried not to look into those bloody, shattered reflections for too long. I felt no pain, though. My heartbeat was still a pounding drum of pure adrenaline, numbing me completely from the agony that I wouldn't feel until later. The only sensation coursing through me at that moment was pure fear terror as I began to consider how many windows, how many mirrors, how many pieces of glass I walked past every day. What if every one of them suddenly contained a monster, ready to leap out at me the moment I made the mistake of looking at it? I stumbled from the bathroom, and Randy saw my bloody hand immediately. He stood up and moved closer to me in the cage so he could examine me better. Ah, you saw him, didn't you? He asked. Yeah, you did. I told you those fuckers were real. Oh, I forgot to mention this curse is contagious, so it spreads to anyone you spend too much time with. Now, get your ass in here and have a drink with me. I promise it'll help. See, I knew we were going to be friends. Nothing says martyrdom like a $5 bottle of scotch. We can be Jones of Ark together. I was too stunned to respond. All I could think to do was follow Dr. Randy's recommendation take a few drinks, and try to drown out the demons. He knew this world better than I did, after all. As much as I thought I had everything figured out, it turns out I didn't know shit about the world. And I didn't know fuck all about Hollow's End. Taking another glass from the desk, I wiped the cobwebs and dead spiders out of it, trying not to think about the mirror and poured myself a glass of the cheap scotch and another, smaller one, for Randy. <sighs> okay, I said, sitting down across from him in the cage. I was wrong. Dead wrong. About everything. Now, can you please tell me what the fuck is going on in this town? Randy smiled and began to speak. 
You can't talk to outsiders about what happens in Hollow's End. But I'm not an outsider anymore. Love it or hate it. I'm a part of this place now. And it's a part of me. I took a deep breath before blowing into the little straw attached to the breathalyzer test. Keep it going. Another few seconds, the newly reinstated sheriff's deputy Randy said from the passenger seat next to me. Finally, the device made a noise and the numbers 0 0.07 appeared on the screen. Okay, I'm good to drive. I'll need to keep ingesting roughly one beer every hour from this point on. Randy nodded. Okay, now you go. I said, replacing the disposable straw in the breathalyzer test. He blew into the straw, and after a few seconds, it came up on the display. Hmm. 0 0.16. That's not going to do it with your tolerance, bud. I'm going to need you to drink something, Randy. you got to be sharp for this. He pulled out a bottle of whiskey and unscrewed the cap, taking a long swig of it before belching. When I was satisfied he was intoxicated enough to avoid seeing any more invisible monsters, I told him to buckle up. I know. Normally I don't condone drinking and driving, even if it is technically within the legal limits. But these were special circumstances. Randy had infected me with some sort of... Well... I don't really know how to describe it. Ghost virus? Hallucinating monster plague? The point is, I was seeing things in mirrors and reflective surfaces now, just like he had been. It was as if they now served as peepholes into another dimension. Therefore, we had covered up the rear view and side mirrors with duct tape. I had also gotten rid of my aviators, which was a shame, because they completed my whole outfit. I was even growing a mustache to complete the small-town, sheriff, everyman appearance, but the hair growth on my upper lip was patchy and gross-looking still. Before growing it, I hadn't even realized that facial dandruff was a real thing. Well, it turns out it definitely is. Sorry, I'm getting tangential again. That happens to me when I drink. To sum it all up, Randy was the old sheriff in Hollow's End, and he'd run into some kind of trouble recently. This trouble had caused him to see horrible things, which appeared in reflective surfaces. Windows and mirrors all over town which had been smashed by him in what I at first assumed was a drunken rage. Now I realize he was drinking to drown out the demons. The liquor made them less noticeable, and less frequent. This case has to be connected with everything that's happening, I said as we started driving, our destination still unknown. That man who disappeared, in, in such a small town, these things have to be connected. Not necessarily, Randy replied. This town is weird as hell, dude. Fucked up shit happens here literally all the time. You just haven't lived here long enough to see any of it. I ignored this and pressed onward, trying to get something useful out of the man. Okay, you're not much help. Is there someone in town who's in the know? Someone who can give us the lowdown? Well, the only person I can think of like that would be the butcher. He's sort of like the unofficial mayor of Hollow's End, Randy explained. But he ain't exactly the talkative type. Great. That's something, at least. Point me towards the butcher shop. Let's go have a chat with this guy, I said to Randy, only to realize he had promptly fallen asleep after his last statement. I drove towards the commercial district. Eyes peeled for a butcher shop sign. Eventually, I found it. We pulled up in front of the place, and I could tell right away that something was off. And by that, I mean there was a terrible smell that I associated with spoiled meat. Something inside the shop was long past its expiration date, and the rank odor was making its way out to the street. There was a closed sign hanging from the door, despite the hours indicating it should be open. Alarm bells started ringing in my mind even louder than before, and I told Randy to watch the front of the shop while I went around to the back. He was now wide awake again, acting as if he hadn't just been asleep seconds prior. After knocking on the back door, I tried the handle. 
to my surprise, it opened. I went inside and was hit with a knockout punch of decay right to the nose. My eyes started watering at the smell of meat gone sour, and the sound of buzzing flies grew louder as I stepped inside the kitchen. There was blood everywhere, and not just in the usual places where you would expect it to be in a butcher shop. It was splattered on the ceiling and all over the floor. There was one particularly large blood stain in the far corner of the room that was in the shape of a human body, and judging by the crimson color of it, whoever had been laying there had lost a sufficient amount of bodily fluids to render them dead half a dozen times over. I heard footsteps from the other side of a translucent plastic curtain which separated the kitchen from the front of the shop. Pulling out my service revolver, I took a cautious step forward and pulled back the hammer, ready for anything. My heart was pounding fast as I spoke in my best, don't fuck with me, cop voice. This is the sheriff. Whoever's behind the curtain, come out with your hands up. Do it now. There was an identical sound on the other side of the divider, indicating another gun was being readied for action. No way, man, said a gruff voice on the other side. You're not taking me alive. My heart skipped a beat as I realized I was potentially about to die. There was going to be a shootout, and a lot more blood was about to be decorating the walls of this butcher shop. Then I realized the voice sounded familiar. Randy? He came through the curtain, and I almost shot him anyways. Ah, sorry, man, I thought you were a bad guy impersonating you. So you decided to impersonate a bad guy. How does that make any sense? They wouldn't kill one of their own, man. Think about it. I let out a deep breath and counted to ten in my mind, trying to think of other ways to stop myself from murdering him. Would anyone notice if Randy went missing? No. Don't think like that. Only bad things will come of it. I tried to focus on the case. That's a lot of blood, I said, pointing at the man-shaped brownish-red puddle in the corner. Looks like some real bad shit went down here. Maybe this butcher guy is good for the murder of our missing man. Nah, Randy said, waving it off. That puddle's been there for weeks. We play poker here every Friday. It's, well, listen, it'd be too hard to explain what happened. But just trust me that the bloodletting was consensual. Even if it did get a bit out of hand. I don't even want to know. Well, you asked. So, all of this blood looks normal to you? For this place, yeah. And the smell. He nodded. But I did notice one weird thing. <sighs> okay, what's that? I asked, completely exasperated by this point. No mirrors anywhere. There's usually a couple of them out in the customer area that are gone now. And he hasn't cleaned his knives. That's not like him. He loves these knives like they're his own non-existent children. It's like he didn't want them to be shiny. He wanted them to stay bloody. Mirrors, glass, steel can be polished to be so reflective you can see your face in it. Or other things. He's infected too. Yep, this shit's spreading. Who knows how far it could get if we don't stop it. He held up one finger, produced a flask from his pocket, and drank a large swallow of whiskey. All right, where to next? He asked after burping loudly. This was a bust. We were walking out the front door of the place when we saw a car pull up to the curb. A young man got out looking like he was in his late 20s. The car had a company name on the side, and I realized it looked familiar. It was actually the next lead I was planning to follow up on. J&M Delivery Co. Booze, burgers, pizza, and more. Delivering to all citizens of Hollow's End. Unless you're a subterranean. No forest deliveries after 4pm. I read the sign twice, and was about to ask the man why they didn't deliver to the subterraneans, and who the subterraneans were. 
and who the hell would order pizza from a forest, but decided it would be better to stay focused. Hey, what are you guys doing here? The man asked, heading towards the shop. Hey, Jay. We're looking for the butcher, but he's gone. Randy replied quickly. Where's Muriel? Maybe she knows something. She's been gone since last night. There was some sort of crisis and she ran out of the house without saying goodbye. I figured the butcher might have an idea where she went. We were just in there. He's gone, but the doors are unlocked. Must have left in a hurry, I said. Does she have a cell phone? Maybe we can track her with GPS. Nah, she's not really into technology. She has one of those brick Nokia phones that she's managed to keep alive for 20 years or so. But she leaves it at home most of the time, and the rest of the time she's at the casino where there's no signal. Okay, maybe that's where she is. I checked already. None of the employees have seen her since the weekend. It occurred to me suddenly that there was another missing person who I was investigating, and this man was a potential witness. I need to ask you about something else, I said, pulling out a picture of the missing man from Night Soil Avenue. Do you know this person? He squinted at it for half a second. Yeah, sure, that's John Grayson. He's a delivery driver with our company. And are you aware that he's been missing now for nearly two days? He hesitated, then looked at Randy. Is he cool? He asked cautiously. Oh yeah, he's got the curse, he's good. I looked back and forth between the two of them. What the fuck? So this is like, just a known thing around here? If I stay in town too long, I'm going to be cursed by this place? No, no. No, well, kinda. It's hard to explain. And even more hard to explain because of all the weird shit going down. Randy said. Now, the important thing is this town has its hooks in you. And because of that, you'll have a difficult time leaving this place. You're a part of it now, and it's a part of you. That's the way it works. Now, one way or another, if you stay in Hollow's End for too long, you're going to get bit by something. I didn't think it was possible for me to be any more confused. Do you got the monkey paw? Randy asked Jay making me even more confused. No, but I'm starting to think it might be the cause of all this trouble. Feeling like I was about to lose my mind, or had already done so, I put my foot down and yelled in my loudest, most authoritativist voice. Enough! The two of them looked at me stupidly. Monkey paws? The butcher? Disappearing people all over town? Just tell me this is a prank. You guys are messing with me, because I'm new in town, right? Is there a YouTube video being filmed? Am I being punked? Is this a reboot? The two men stared at me for a moment longer, then went back to talking as if I weren't standing there. Yeah, it's definitely got something to do with that paw. The butcher should have just gotten rid of the damn thing when he found in that shipment of discarded monkey carcasses. Everyone knows monkey paw wishes are tainted. Who the fuck would be dumb enough to actually use one of them? Jay was saying. Well, I mean, how could you possibly know just by looking at the monkey paw that it's evil? There have to be at least a few good monkey paws out there with wish-granting abilities, right? Jay and I suddenly shared a psychic thought connection, and I saw he had the same idea I did at the exact same moment. You made a wish on the fucking monkey paw, didn't you? We both blurted out in unison. Randy looked down at the ground. It took a few seconds for him to confess. When he finally did, it was in the most obnoxious, affected, half-apologetic tone of voice I had ever heard. I always wanted to be able to teleport like Nightcrawler from X-Men. I didn't realize it was going to open up a series of gateways to alternate dimensions, potentially causing the destruction of reality. That part was completely unexpected. It took me a few moments to figure out what he meant, but then it all came together. It was your fault. You made me see the monsters in the mirrors. It was all because of you and your stupid monkey paw wish. Yeah, he admitted. But on the plus side, check this out. 
he jumped into the nearby front window of the butcher shop, and instead of shattering, it rippled outwards from its center like a pool of water disrupted by a stone being thrown into it. He disappeared into the glass and was gone. The two of us stood there for several minutes in stunned silence, unsure if he was going to come back. I went into the shop to see if he was in there, but it was empty. Just as we were about to walk away awkwardly, he leapt back through the liquid glass carrying a bag of fast food in his hand. The paper bag was stained with grease and said KFC on it. See? We don't even have one of these in town. I just teleported to Pittsburgh and back. The window glass continued to make ripples and didn't settle down into its usual smoothness, I noticed. Not only that, but there was now something moving in the glass. A huge dark creature with long limbs crawling on six legs. It was sniffing the ground like a dog hunting a rabbit. Then it turned sharply to look at us through the glass. There was no question in my mind that it saw us. Randy... Did you ever consider that using the powers granted by the cursed magic monkey paw might be a very bad idea? He looked at me stupidly. A strange sound began to come from the other side of the window glass of the storefront, as a set of huge legs came through from the other side, followed by another, and another, and another. It was an indescribable sound. But if I had to compare it to anything, it would be like if fingernails on a chalkboard and microphone feedback had an ear-splitting baby together. Sitting atop the legs with too many joints was a horrifying creature with a long snout lined with sharp teeth. Odd openings split its rough alligator skin in places looking like gills, but not quite. Its eyes were black and dull as it surveyed the downtown street of Hollow's End. After it was through the glass, it sniffed the air, and I hoped that maybe this creature didn't breathe oxygen, and it would keel over dead from the toxic air of our world. But, of course, the stupid thing was fine. I guess whatever world it came from had a similar atmosphere to ours. A second later, it spotted us and began to race toward us, with murder in its eyes. Run! I yelled and turned around to see Jay and Randy already in their respective vehicles, and ready to drive away without me. Hop in! Randy yelled, shifting over into the passenger seat. Come on, man, get away from that thing. Whatever it is, it looks pissed! We were driving rapidly down Main Street, as a horrible creature from another dimension followed behind us. Its long strides keeping pace and making the car shake with each step it took. The engine roared as we sped away from the butcher shop. Randy was sitting in the seat next to me, and it took me a moment to realize he was eating something. It was a bucket of KFC. Seriously, Randy? How can you be hungry at a time like this? We're about to die. Eh, We got bigger problems than that right now, he said, patting down his pockets with greasy fingers, and leaving stains as he searched for something. We're all out of booze. We need to make a pit stop as soon as you get a chance. Normally this would be an absurd statement, but unfortunately the lack of alcohol was a bit of an issue, since there were plenty more monsters ready to come through into our world, and the only thing keeping them out was our ability to stay intoxicated so we didn't see them. I had kept my percentage down below the legal driving limit, but I was starting to feel like that wasn't cutting it anymore. You really need to start drinking more, Randy explained. You're the one who saw it first, remember? If anything, this is kind of your fault. I gripped the steering wheel with white-knuckled rage and continued driving. Regardless of what he said, I want to make sure it's on the record that this was all Randy's fault. He had admitted to making at least one wish using a cursed magic monkey paw, and we all know how that usually plays out. I saw a convenience store and immediately slammed on the brakes. Reaching over across Randy, I threw open his door and kicked him out. It was easy since he wasn't wearing a seatbelt and was already asleep. What the fuck, dude? He yelled as I pulled away. Get us more booze. 
I'm going to circle the block. I shouted at him out the window, picking up speed. Then I took out my gun and aimed at the monster, which was getting closer by the second. I took three shots at it over my shoulder and missed with two of them, but the third caught it squarely in the neck, and it began to howl a guttural cry, dripping black blood all over the street from its fresh wound. It slowed down momentarily, but then picked up its pace again, coming after me with renewed rage. My goal had been accomplished, though. I'd been trying to keep it away from Randy, since he was on foot and more vulnerable. We would need to abandon the car, though, I realized. If I was going to start drinking more, I wouldn't be able to drive safely. As bad as things were getting, I wasn't about to start breaking the law. Especially that particular one. I'd seen enough death and destruction caused by drunk drivers over my years on the force. I wasn't going to go down that road. I looked back to see the creature still gaining on me. My mind was racing, trying to think of how to evade it, to outwit it. I needed to do something to kill it. But what? Suddenly my cell phone was ringing. I picked it up and looked at the caller ID. It was Jay, the delivery driver. He was in the car ahead of me, and I had kind of forgotten he was there. Listen, he said quickly. I got a plan. We need to lure that thing to the swamp. Just follow me and keep up the pace. It's a cop car, I said dryly. I'm pretty sure I can keep up with your piece of shit. My words were cut short as the line went dead and the car ahead of me began to accelerate rapidly. I floored it, but found the guy was still gaining distance between the two of us. Whatever he had under the hood was making that little car go a lot faster than I would have ever thought possible. My phone dinged, and I looked down to see a text from Jay. It was an eggplant, with a water spray emoji. This fucking town. We reached the edge of the city limits of Hollow's End, to find a parking lot which sloped at an unnatural angle downwards. At the bottom of this strange gravel lot was a murky-looking swamp full of brackish green water, a small copse of trees stood to one side near the shore. No other cars were parked there, which was good, since the creature was still behind us. I was following Jay as closely as I could, and imitating his car's movements, although my vehicle was sluggish and clumsy by comparison. He was still driving at top speed, and I figured it was important that I keep up with him for whatever he planned to do. When we reached the edge of the water, near that little grouping of trees, he hit the brakes and swerved to the right. His tire stayed on the gravel, but just barely. The entire parking lot was sloped so severely towards the water that the force of gravity was insisting on taking us into the swamp. Realizing that my bigger vehicle wouldn't make the turn in time, I hit the brakes early and tried to slow down. Knowing that otherwise I would crash right into a tree, or go into the water trying to make the move. As soon as I slowed down, I could hear the creature's breath, and its movements just behind the car. I avoided the temptation to look back, since I knew it would be my death if I did. Instead, I yanked hard on the wheel, and turned it to the right, skidding to a stop on the grass, my fender just inches away from a large pine tree. The creature's brakes were not quite as good as mine, since it was desperate to kill me and hadn't really slowed down. Instead, it went skidding into the green water, coated with algae and looking much thicker than was normal. It was like a giant bowl of pea soup. The creature was thrashing around, looking as if it were in pain, and then I noticed the tendrils of swamp water moving on its skin, pulling it in deeper like an enormous squid wrestling with a shark. My phone rang again and I picked it up, my eyes still focused on the creature trying to get out of the swamp. It looked like it would not be able to escape from whatever was holding it there, and I breathed a sigh of relief that I hadn't gone in with that wild last-minute maneuver. Then it was as if an enormous hand reached up from below and pulled the creature under. Despite the fact that there were only dark, empty sockets where the eyes should have been, I could have sworn I saw them widen as it was dragged under, and then was gone. Problem solved, 
Jay said when I answered the phone. You can thank me later. And we'll definitely owe Swampy a favor. Now let's get back into town and grab Randy. Maybe the three of us can figure out a solution to this whole mess. I managed to convince Jay to let me ride shotgun in his car, telling him that mine was having engine trouble. This was partly as a ploy to make him our designated driver, but also to cover for the fact that he was clearly the superior driver of a far better automobile than my cruiser, and who knew when we'd have to outrun one of those monsters again. After applying copious amounts of duct tape to all the mirrors in the vehicle, we were off, heading back towards the convenience store where I'd left Randy. We found him out front with a large paper bag full of bottles in his arms, sleeping soundly in the grassy ditch near the road. There were several children taking turns at poking him with a stick. Okay, beat it, kids. I yelled at them as we approached. The children ran off, and out of the corner of my eye I noticed a few of them looked very odd. One had a furry face and ears like a dog, while another had red eyes, and yet another was running on all fours. They scattered in every direction, making it difficult to pinpoint any other discrepancies. What's the deal with this town? I muttered to no one in particular. <laughs> How much time do you have? Jay asked, laughing. This place is weirder than you could possibly imagine. There's a lot of history here. Sorry to say, you didn't really know what you were getting into when you moved to this place. Uh, can you give me a quick summary? I asked, kicking Randy gently in the ribs. He snored and swatted the air like an annoyed cat, then rolled over onto his other side. His right leg began to pump up and down as if he were chasing a rabbit in his dreams. I'm not really at liberty to discuss all of it. People in Hollow's End prefer to keep their secrets to themselves. But if you get to know them, you'll find most folks are decent enough. As long as you live here, anyways. Tourists do tend to occasionally go missing, if they stay out past sunrise. And if you meet anyone wearing a hooded robe, your best bet's to avoid them. Oh, and there's this guy Frank, who... Randy sat bolt upright, screaming at the top of his lungs, clutching the bag of liquor bottles so tightly against his chest that I thought they might shatter. Hey, it's okay, man. I said, leaning down to pat his shoulder in what I hoped was a comforting gesture. It's just a nightmare. He was breathing heavily for a few moments and didn't respond, but then finally he unscrewed the cap of one of the liquor bottles and took a long gulp. Right, a nightmare. That's all it was. He didn't sound entirely convinced. Alright, so what's the plan, guys? Jay asked. I'm happy to help out if you need me to. I took one of the liquor bottles from Randy and took a long drink from it. After wiping my mouth, I screwed the cap back on and stuffed the bottle in my pocket. Thinking hard about the next lead to follow up on, I came up short. We didn't really have anything. Mm, do you know anyone who would be interested in buying a monkey paw? I asked. Is there anyone in town dumb enough or reckless enough to take ownership of it? Because I feel like that fucking thing is at the center of all of this. And it's like a murder investigation. If we can find the weapon used to commit the crime, we might be able to solve it. Jay looked at me, and Randy looked at the ground between his legs. I know just the guy, Jay answered. You know how I was telling you to stay away from Frank? Well... We might need to disregard that advice, just temporarily. The three of us pulled up outside a house a short while later, now with Jay behind the wheel chauffeuring us around town. We went up to the front door, and he continued explaining the protocol for how to deal with this Frank individual. So remember, don't stare, and don't go inside his house. Whatever he wants to tell us, he can tell us outside. People who go in there are usually tourists, and they are never, ever seen again. That's like guaranteed death just stepping into that place. I tried not to think about how many rules I was breaking, how many vows and my oath as a sheriff were now completely null and void. 
You know I'm a police officer, right? Most people don't speak so freely about the kidnapping and murder of tourists. Randy slapped my arm. Oh, come on, man. Just when we're starting to think you're cool, you go say something like that. Killing tourists is a proud tradition in Hollow's End. If you don't like it, you shouldn't have moved here. I didn't have time to debate the subject anymore, as Jay was now knocking on the front door of the house. The door swung open on the first knock as if it had been slightly ajar. Hello? Jay said into the darkness. Frank? Are you there? I need to talk to you about something. He stuck his head into the dark gap afforded by the open door. For a moment, I had a horrible mental image of it slamming shut on his neck, squeezing and choking him as blood poured from wounds created by the pressure of sharp wood on his flesh. But instead, something worse happened. Jay let out a gasp, and then disappeared through the gap, as if he had just been picked up by his hair and dragged inside by a hungry bear. My heart was pounding fast, as I realized I was going to have to ignore all of Jay's warnings if I was going to save him and the town. Despite the dangers, we were going to have to go inside after all. I stared at the dark, open doorway in terror and disbelief. Jay had just disappeared into the house, after it looked like someone very powerful had picked him up by the top of his head to drag him in there. I had caught a glimpse of a large, furry blue hand, reminding me of Sully from Monsters, Inc. Help! I heard Jay scream a second later, before his cries were cut short by a hand or a fuzzy gag over his mouth. We gotta save him, I said to Randy, looking at my drunken deputy with deep concern. You go in first. He shook his head, no. Uh-uh. I'm not going in there. That big blue bastard will kill us all. I say we leave. Jay can handle himself. He's a professional. I let out an annoyed grunt and pushed my way through the door and into the house. Looked like I'd have to deal with this myself. What else was new? Jay? I called out, entering the dark home. Immediately, I was assaulted by a horrific odor. It smelled like dead bodies and spoiled meat, mixed with blood and shit and all the worst smells I could think of. It was like a rainbow of decay, one of every terrible variety. Help! I heard Jay cry again, and I followed the sound of his voice going deeper into the darkness. Eventually, I came to a room with a giant rectangular mirror facing upwards in the center, sitting atop a dining room table. It reminded me a bit of a sacrificial altar. Jay was laying on top of it, tied up with thick rope. The gag which had been stuffed into his mouth had slipped out and he was screaming at me. Look out! I ducked as a giant furry fist came flying at the side of my head. It connected with the wall beside where I had been standing a moment earlier, and the plaster caved inward. The entire room shook with the impact and dust and debris snowed down from overhead. Die, you interdimensional bastard! A deep voice boomed as he swung his fist at me again. I ducked and rolled out of the way, surprised at my own reflexes. Wait! I yelled. We're from this dimension. We're trying to save it. That's why we came for the monkey paw. Frank's eyes turned to narrow slits as he scrutinized me. Yeah, do you have it? Jay asked from where he was laying on top of the mirror. The enormous blue creature stood panting in front of us, looking angry but uncertain now. His teeth were bared, showing long canines everywhere as he seemed to contemplate whether we were lying or not. How do I know you're not from another dimension? He asked, showing me the long talons on the end of his fingers. There was dried blood hardened at the tips. You can ask us anything, I said. Something that someone from another dimension would never know. Frank stood there thinking about it for a few seconds. Okay. Best Nicolas Cage movie. Go. 
Seriously? It's more of an opinion-based answer, isn't it? He began to growl low and deep under his breath. Okay, whoa, short fuse. Gone in 60 seconds. No, Ghost Rider. Wait, Con Air. I guess National Treasure was pretty good, too. He seemed to relax after that. Good work. You passed. But I said four different answers. How is that even a test for interdimensional beings? Don't they have Nicolas Cage in other dimensions? Mm, Yes. But he accepts so many rules, the possibilities are endless. Very few dimensions have overlapping Nicolas Cage filmographies. Frank grumbled back. And I don't have the monkey paw. The last person I saw it with was Randy. Son of a bitch, I said running back to the front door. I circled the house, looking everywhere for him. But of course, Randy was long gone. Of course he had it the whole time, I said as I re-entered the room. Why does that not surprise me in the slightest? Frank was untying Jay and helping him down from the sacrificial altar made from an old mirror and a table. What the hell were you going to do with all this anyway? I asked Frank, trying not to stare. Before today, I would have run out of the room screaming, just looking at him. But after all I'd been through, a talking, ten-foot-tall blue bear made of shag carpeting was the least of my concerns. Mm, I don't want to talk about it. Come on, Frank. We're trying to save Hollow's End here. We need your help. What the hell were you planning? Just tell us, Frank. Jay pleaded. Muriel needs our help, man. He let out a deep, rumbling sigh. (sighs) That's what I was doing. I was trying to figure out a way to get over there, he said eventually. Muriel asked for my help the other day, and I said no. Then she didn't come back, and... You were trying to save her, Jay yelled, smiling triumphantly. So you do have a heart in there somewhere, you big furry lump. Frank moved so quickly that he was a blur, picking Jay up by the throat and then holding him against the wall. His face began to turn pink, then red, then purple, as he ran out of oxygen. I do not have a heart. I have six hearts, and you will not speak of this to anyone or I will take out yours and make it an even seven. He dropped Jay to the ground where he lay in a heap, trying to catch his breath. I heard him squeak something that sounded like an apology. All right, thanks for clearing that up, Frank. Now, can you help us? Since we kind of have the same overall goal in mind. We all want to save Muriel and the Butcher and that other guy that I kind of forgot about until just now. Sorry, there's a lot of people missing and I'm kind of drunk. Why are you drunk? Frank asked. Are you not a police officer? I thought that you are on duty. Yes, yes, and yes. And I'm drunk for the same reason you're going to want to be drunk pretty soon. This interdimensional virus is contagious and you're both going to start seeing some weird shit unless you get a little fucked up with me. Which reminds me, you should probably break that mirror. Seven years of bad luck is a hell of a lot better than the current alternative. Eventually the three of us left Frank's house. He managed to disguise himself using a large trench coat and a hat. But it was still pretty obvious that he was a ten foot tall furry blue monster. Regardless, he got to sit shotgun. And I was forced to squeeze into the back seat behind his girth since there was a large tank of nitrous oxide taking up most of the legroom behind Jay's seat. Okay, where would he be this time of day? I asked, thinking out loud. The two of them thought about it and began to name a few potential spots. The monkey bars at the jungle gym, the ditch in front of the liquor store, the petting zoo, and Randy's other frequent haunts. We spent nearly an hour visiting all of them, then ran out of ideas. Well, I guess there is one more place, I said. But there is no way he'd be stupid enough to go there. Well, lead the way, Jay said optimistically. That sounds exactly right. 
When I opened the door to the sheriff's station, I was not entirely surprised to see Randy sitting in the jail cell with the cage door closed. He was drinking out of my coffee mug again, looking very pleased with himself. You had it this whole time? I nearly screamed at him as I entered, pulling out the keys for the jail cell. How would you lie to me like that? I thought you were trying to help me. Hey now, I never lied to you. That is a complete mischaracterization. I simply asked Jay if he had the monkey paw, implying that I didn't have it. Implying and lying are two totally different things. Oh, I hate you so much right now. Jay marched over and pointed at him, looking ready to say something really crippling, something really mean, but then slowly lowered his finger and just nodded his head. Yeah, we all hate you. Frank too, right Frank? Yes, I hate being forced to leave my dark secluded home to socialize with others. Now, hand over the monkey paw, Randy. No can do, furball. I got plans for this paw, Randy said, removing the cursed object from his coat pocket. Two of the five fingers had been lowered, meaning he had already made two wishes, and now had three left. It's evil, Randy. That fucking thing is cursed. You've seen the damage it can do. How can you keep acting like this? I was still searching for the jail cell key on the ring and realized it was now gone. He stole the key, I muttered to Jay. I can't get in there. Frank overheard this and marched toward the cage. He reached over and pulled the door with one hand, tearing it from its hinges and snapping the lock. Shards of metal went flying and landed on the ground. Wish it all back to normal again. Tell that paw you want to make everything the way it was, Frank said advancing on Randy. Do it, or I will tear off your head from your shoulders and use it as a tetherball. That sounds messy. Randy held out the monkey paw as if to hand it over. Then at the last second he made another wish. Of course, since it was Randy, it was a really stupid wish. The polar bear he summoned was larger than Frank, but not by much. The two of them began to fight almost immediately, as if the bear knew that he was the biggest threat in the room and, like a man on his first day in prison, wanted to show his dominance. As the two of them wrestled, I tried to come up with something to make him get rid of it, to wish it away back to where it came from. Man, uh, send that poor thing back to the Arctic. That's just mean. They're already endangered. Haven't you seen those videos of them floating on the chunks of ice? I hoped this tactic would work, and was once again surprised when it did. Moments after the epic battle began, it ended just as abruptly, as Randy sent the creature back to the Arctic, just as it was about to tear out one of Frank's six hearts. Note to self. Randy likes animals. Use this to manipulate him. I looked to see that Randy only had one wish left. He'd wasted two of them on summoning the polar bear and then sending it back where it came from. We need you to think about this rationally, Randy. You need to use that last wish to save the town. Just tell the monkey paw to change everything back to normal and bring back the butcher and Muriel. That's three wishes, he interjected. It doesn't work that way. Trust me, I tried. A hot fudge sundae without peanuts is really not as good, by the way. Oh, cursed monkey paw. He always knows how to screw you. You wasted a wish on... Oh, fuck it, never mind. I guess we're going to have to save Muriel and the butcher ourselves, I said. Don't forget that other guy, Jay interjected. Oh yeah, and that other guy, John, I think his name was. Anyways... Uh, let's go to the other dimension, save them. Then when we get back here, you can wish for everything to go back to normal. Okay, Randy? He nodded reluctantly. Yeah, I guess that's fair. But I get to hang on to the monkey paw until then. If shit goes down, I want to have an exit strategy. Fair enough, I said. 
Okay, let's find a mirror and go into this other dimension, I guess. Hopefully it's not too late. We went downtown and found a home decor shop, which sold several varieties of mirrors, big and small. I went inside and bought the largest, cheapest one I could find, saving the receipt for tax purposes. This had to qualify for a work expense, but I hoped I wouldn't have to explain that to an auditor. Alright, how does this work exactly? I asked Randy, resting the mirror against the side of the building so that we could step through it like a doorway. Well, all I do is I think about where I want to go. And then, when I step into the mirror, I come out where I want to be on the other side. I'm assuming you guys can just follow me, but it probably wouldn't hurt to think mirror world in your mind when you walk through. You know, in case you don't want to wind up uh, in a timeless void with no hope of escape. I haven't put much thought into it, though. Frank, Jay, and I looked at each other nervously. Okay, here goes nothing, Randy said, stepping into the mirror. It rippled and moved like water, and then he was gone. You go next, Jay said to me, nudging me forward. I'll be right behind you. I took a deep, trembling breath. Terrified, I stepped into the glass. I stepped into the mirror and felt like I was submerged in icy cold water for a moment, closing my eyes instinctively. I opened them again to find myself in another world. The air was breathable, and the temperature was similar to Earth, but that was where the similarities ended. The sky above was a rusty shade of red, the ground a pale purple color. This area of what was previously Hollow's End was now a windswept desert wasteland. There were only a few buildings, and sparse signs of civilization could be seen here and there in the distance. But there were signs of civilization, which told me there were people here, or something like them. The buildings in the distance were obscured partially by the constant sand blowing through the air which stung my eyes. I got the impression of strange, carnival tent-shaped structures, their surfaces covered with spiderweb patterns. Randy was up ahead, marching forward as if he knew where he was going. I ran to catch up with him, not wanting to yell. Hey man, where are we going? What's the plan? I asked after I'd caught up to him. Then I realized who I was asking, and it occurred to me just how deep in the shit I was. Back on Earth, I would never trust Randy's sense of direction or leadership qualities. What made me think they would be any better in this dimension? I don't know where I'm going, he said. I was just trying to get far enough away from all you to take a piss. You keep fucking following me. For a second, I almost granted him his privacy, but then thought better of it. I grabbed him by the back of his shirt, pulling him toward me. It helped that I stood at least a foot taller than him. But I could tell by his resistance that he had some sort of wiry strength hidden behind his bulky, ragged clothing. You have foregone all rights to privacy, Randy. That's what happens when you repeatedly deceive me and disappear randomly for hours at a time. Do you have any idea how frustrating that is? He didn't seem to be listening at all. At least, that's what I thought at first. But then he unzipped his pants and started pissing right in front of me staring in my eyes the whole time like a territorial street dog, indicating he'd heard every word. There you go, buddy. Is how you like it? You want to see the show, sicky? The rest of our party looked embarrassed for me, but did not question my methods. None of us trusted Randy anymore, especially me. All right, I said once he was finished and had zipped up his pants most of the way again. The question is, how are we going to find the Butcher and Muriel? And that other guy, Jay interjected. And that other guy, how are we going to find them in this place? We don't have the slightest idea where to look. Randy said something behind me, but I ignored him. I have a good nose. I could try to sniff them out. Does anyone have any personal items belonging to them? Frank offered. We all shook our heads. Randy said something again, more urgently this time. 
I continued to ignore him. Well, we have to travel on foot. So it would be a good idea to get moving as quick as possible. Who knows when the sun goes down in this world. And what things might come out after dark. Jay said. Will you people fucking listen to me? Randy screamed, sounding angry. We all collectively shushed him, terrified as we saw lights coming on and movement outside the nearby structures. There is a fucking blood trail right over here, you assholes. Now come on, let's follow it. What are the chances people bleed red in this dimension too? Practically zero. I hurried after Randy, hoping he was right. Either way, it would be a good idea to get away from those structures, and whoever lived there. They seemed to be keenly aware of our presence, and I suspected they might come out to investigate the noise. Frank and Jay were following us, looking nervous at the prospect of trusting Randy, and I couldn't really blame them. Eventually we found a building where the trail of blood seemed to end. It looked like an old barn, except the angles were warped and distorted, and it was elevated on crooked stilts like a defunct beach house. A trail of blood led up a staircase where a tall door sat waiting for us. I drew my gun from its holster and pulled back the hammer, getting ready to fire on whatever creature was waiting for us inside. Randy stepped to the side to allow anyone else but himself to go in first. Frank decided to do the honors and swung the door open wide. It slammed against the interior wall, making a loud noise that I wished had been quieter. We have found your blood trail, Frank announced, shaking the barn with each lumbering step he took. We know you are here. We have come to help you. Do not be afraid. There is no more surefire way to make somebody afraid than to tell them not to be afraid, Randy said, making his way inside. Let me try, you blue dick Sasquatch fucker. He pushed his way past the giant monster, and I thought he was going to be murdered. But instead, Frank let him speak. Hey guys, we're here to rescue you. It's Randy, Jay, Frank, and that new sheriff guy. I forget his name, but he's cool. Listen, I know you're probably injured and scared. But we know how to get back home and close the portals to the other dimension. Just come out and let us help you. It was the most intelligent and eloquently simple speech I'd ever heard Randy make. And, of course, was also entirely imaginary and never happened. Instead of that, Randy began to speak nonsensically and made several rambling metaphors involving alligators and the importance of allowing zebra mussels to be allowed across international borders on the hulls of large ships. Is that you, Randy? An old woman's voice called out from the shadows. Butcher's hurt. He's not doing too good. Muriel! Randy, Jay, and Frank shouted in unison. They ran over and I followed after them. Clearly, Frank and the butcher had a history as well. Since he was leaning over and trying to check on the giant man. At least, I think he was a man. The butcher looked like a vaguely humanoid monster made up of several different people who had been sewn crudely together using a variety of different strings of dubious quality. He was still clutching a huge meat cleaver in his hand, which I assumed was his weapon of choice. But he was breathing weakly in and out, and his eyes were mostly closed. There was a bloodied pile of rags covering what I assumed was a grievous injury to his midsection. Can you carry him? Muriel asked Frank. I couldn't just leave him here, and he can't walk. I will try, Frank said, but he is a big motherfucker. He bent over to pick up the huge man, and Jay ran over to help. I stood with my back to them, surveying the exits and holding my gun up ready to fire. I was getting a bad feeling about all of this. It was a little too easy. This will not be easy. Let's go, Frank grunted, carrying the butcher on his shoulders with Jay following behind, carrying his feet, or at least attempting to. Randy was helping Muriel, and I realized that she was injured too. 
I went back to help him, and they shooed me away, telling me to keep my gun up and ready to fire. There are creatures in this world. They look like giant insects. Spiders. Mean and cruel. Only looking to cause pain and suffering. They mostly come out at night, though. Muriel told us. Mostly. The butcher wheezed, his eyes half-closed. Oh, that's a relief. It's daytime, I think. Or maybe dusk? There are others, too. They come out during the night and the day. They look like us, like people, but... I thought of the woman in the bathroom mirror, the first thing I'd seen from the other world. She had opened her mouth and spiders had poured out. The memory of it was horrifying and I hated to think about it. I've seen them, I said, once, in a reflection back in our dimension. I think we should try to avoid them at all costs. They're probably a lot smarter than us when it comes to this interdimensional travel business. What makes you think that? Jay asked. Just a hunch. Maybe they're the ones who sent that dismembered monkey paw over to us in the first place. Might have been their way to get us to open a doorway that they couldn't open for themselves. Haven't you guys seen Fringe? Or Community? They shook their collective heads and I groaned inwardly. We left the barn to stand on the stoop just outside the front door. When we got out there, I looked to see there were people waiting for us just outside. Not people, though. Not quite. They had the upper bodies of humans, but their lower halves looked like giant spiders. That's probably the best way I could describe them, but it wasn't quite right either. I let out a gasp as I realized they looked just like us. Twins of each one of us. The Butcher, Frank, Jay, Randy, Muriel, me, and oh yeah, also John, that other guy I keep forgetting about. He was there too. He just didn't say much. He, he was probably in shock. Who the hell are you fuckers? Randy asked, patting down his pockets for his flask. We are you, said Spider Butcher, holding a large meat cleaver in one hand. But we are wiser, faster. Stronger. You do not deserve your world with its unlimited resources. You squander and waste all that you have been given. That is why we made you open the door to our world. To allow us to follow you through. All we need is for you to go back and we can go with you. And we will bring with us an army. Why are you telling us all this? Jay asked. You sound like a really cliche supervillain right now. What's your motivation? Power. And knowing our plan makes no difference to us. You can try to fight us. Or you can try to escape. Either way, we win. There is a third option, though. And what's that? I asked. You could join us. You could give up this pitiful resistance and submit to our superior intelligence and cool spider bodies, admit defeat, and become our escorts back to your world. We would show you mercy if you were to do that. We might even allow you to live. Muriel scoffed. Oh, don't believe a word they say, she whispered. Their spider bodies aren't that cool. And they're liars. They think we're lower than cockroaches. I have encountered this bunch before. I got the feeling they were the ones who had injured the butcher. Boy, you guys are awful generous. Randy said, unscrewing the cap from a bottle of liquor he'd found somewhere. How could you drink at a time like this? I whispered to him as he took a swig. He winked at me and pulled two more items from his other pocket. A lighter and a strip of cloth. After stuffing the wick into the bottle, he set it alight and hurled it at the crowd of spider people. They scattered in all directions, but not quite fast enough, as the liquid fire exploded and landed on a few of them. 
including Spider Butcher. He let out a screeching howl that split my eardrums. At least the numbers were a bit more even now, I thought to myself. I began to take well-aimed shots at them with my pistol as they scattered and began to shoot webbing from their buttholes, lifting off into the sky with anal grappling hooks. A second later, they had disappeared from sight, but I knew they would be still close by. They were just hiding so I couldn't shoot at them. Sweet. I guess they don't have guns in this dimension, Randy said, pulling out his own pistol. They might have other stuff, though. You know, flamethrowers, whatnot. We should probably run. We hustled down the stairs and began to run as fast as we could back towards the location of the portal. Terrified, I took a look back to see if we were being followed. I caught fleeting glimpses of things in the shadows. Large, fast-moving forms that leapt across huge gaps and kept pace with us. The darkness was deepening all around, making it difficult to see. I realized the sun was setting, or had already set in this world, and it would be night very soon. Muriel had warned us not to be out after dark, since there were creatures that slept during the day and hunted at night. I had almost been killed by one of those monsters previously, and I didn't want to run into one of them again. The only thing that had saved me was an equally terrifying monster named Swampy, who I probably now owed a favor. Swampy can't save us this time, Jay yelled, clearly having the same thought. I could hear the creatures waking up and calling out to each other in the encroaching darkness. They let out high, chittering noises that made my skin crawl. Oh, fuck, what is that thing? Muriel said suddenly, coming to a sliding halt. I looked up to see something we'd mistaken for a nearby mountain. It was blinking. Enormous tentacles began to whip and snap on its sides, and a huge eye blinked sleepily open in the center of it all. The effect was utterly terrifying, like waking up and realizing you fell asleep on a dragon's doorstep. That one monstrous eye turned to look directly at us, the pupil narrowing and constricting as it focused on us, and then the creature began to move, walking on its tentacles like an octopus on the ocean floor. With each step it took toward us, the ground shook and heaved, sending us off balance as we tried to run. The door! It's our only chance! Jay yelled, pointing up ahead where a tall, dark rectangle was waiting. We were only about ten yards away from the doorway when a figure appeared, suddenly blocking our path. Oh, you're not getting away that easily, Spider Randy hissed, his voice menacing and cruel as an animated supervillain. We haven't gotten to sample any of your blood yet. Person Randy shot Spider Randy in the face, and black blood spurted out, sizzling as it hit the ground, as if composed of acid. You guys really need to make up your mind about a few things, Randy said, firing again as the creature crawled away, mortally wounded. Are you spiders, or are you mosquitoes? Spiders don't drink blood. At least, I'm pretty sure they don't. Muriel stood by the portal, ushering in Jay first, and then John and Randy. But Randy stopped at the last second, pushing her in first. She yelled a curse word at him as she fell through back into our world. You next, man, my deputy said to Frank, still carrying the butcher on his broad blue shoulders. Not so fast, another spider person said from nearby, shooting a stream of butt webbing which blocked the exit. It turned out to be Spider Me. The creature with my face descended from above and landed softly on the ground in front of us. It stood taller than any of us, even Frank, and was at least twelve feet high, perched on thin, angular legs that came to sharp points at the bottom. It danced back and forth, moving with agile grace and a speed that scared the hell out of me. You still don't get it, Spider Muriel said, lowering herself from the heights above us on a silky butt strand. It doesn't matter what you do. We win. We always win. We have seen this play out in many universes, in many ways. But it always ends up the same. We win, you lose. It is the way it was always meant to be. No matter how many dimensions we find, they all fall to our power. Yours will be no different. 
Randy fumbled in his pocket for something as the ground continued to shake even more violently beneath our feet. The huge tentacle monster was getting closer, blocking out the sky with its mountainous ass. More spider people were blocking the exit now, and I realized our hopes of getting out of this dimension were dwindling rapidly. We were running out of options. How many bullets do you have left? I asked Randy, checking my own gun and seeing that I only had a couple of rounds. Four, he said. You? Two. He shook his head. Not enough. I will tear out their hearts with my bare teeth, Frank said, dropping the butcher to the ground where he landed in a heap. I always wanted more hearts. Randy made a noise, indicating that he should wait. Hang on there, blue balls. I think I got an idea. Before I could stop him, Randy was holding up the monkey paw in his free hand. Only one wish was left, one finger still raised, and he held it up for all the spider folks to see. This is what I think of all your plans, he said, waving the monkey's middle finger at them. I've got one wish left, and I'm gonna fuck up your shit with it. He threw his loaded gun at me, and I caught it. My heart skipped a beat after realizing it had one in the chamber, but thankfully I didn't shoot myself with it. That would have been embarrassing. After that, Randy immediately began running in the direction of the giant tentacle monster, which now stood taller than the Burj Khalifa and blocked all visible light. Come and get it, bitches! Randy was running surprisingly fast for a drunk person, and only fell down twice, as he escaped from the crowd, and several of the spider people chased after him. Spider Muriel nearly snatched him up as he fell down the second time, but he sprung to his feet again like a hurdle jumper and was off a moment later, running again. More giant spider creatures were moving in from the shadows nearby, and I saw that they were the kind that were all spider, the huge ones that had chased us in our world. We need to go, I said to Frank, grabbing his furry blue arm. He picked up the butcher, casting a weary look over his shoulder at Randy, running off into the distance where a mountain-sized monster was waiting and where spider people were chasing him. He will die if we leave him, Frank muttered, sounding hesitant. And we'll die if we don't, I said back, struggling to get the words out. I felt like a traitor. He knows what he's doing. He's sacrificing himself for us. The butcher let out a wet cough, spraying blood from his nose and mouth. Frank let out a deep sigh and put the huge man back on his shoulder again. The two of us looked back over our shoulders at Randy and saw him waving at us with the monkey paw, yelling at us to run. It looked like he was giving us the finger, but I knew he meant well. Let's go, I said, tugging on Frank's arm again. We need to go now. The creatures were closing in. I could see their red eyes glowing as they got closer. Frank threw the butcher into the open doorway and then ducked under the weapon to go inside. I followed after him. I was most of the way through the portal when something grabbed my foot. It began to pull. Hard. For a second it felt as if my leg would be torn clean off as I stood halfway in and halfway out of our world. Sharp talons dug into my flesh, and I began to scream and rake my fingers across the sidewalk as I was dragged back into the doorway. My fingernails chipped and left white marks on the concrete, one of them breaking off entirely as blood wept from the ends of them. I dug in my heel and howled for someone to save me. A second later, Frank was there, grabbing my wrist and trying to pull me back into our world. But as strong as he was... The thing in the other dimension was stronger. And then Jay and John and Muriel were there too. They pulled and pulled on my arm until it felt like it would tear free from my shoulder. It popped and dislocated as I screamed. And then they pulled some more. No matter how hard they tried, I was still being dragged into the portal by my one leg. My other one was free, but not for much longer at this rate. Pretty soon it would be forced into the doorway as well, and I would be dragged through the rest of the way. Stand back, 
a deep baritone voice commanded, and they parted like the Red Sea for the butcher and his cleaver. He was wheezing and coughing up blood, dragging himself along the ground, and when he was close enough, he lifted the blade and brought it down on my hamstring. Blood erupted like a geyser, spraying everyone nearby with crimson fluid. I felt them digging their fingernails in tighter, trying to keep a grip on my leg through the gore. One more clean swing of the blade was all it took, and the bone split, separating my leg into two pieces. The creatures in the other dimension would get to feast on the part I'd lost. But that was okay. Most of me was on this side of the doorway. And that was what mattered. That got me thinking about Randy again. And I felt a deep pang of regret. An unfathomable sadness wash over me. And just as it felt as if things couldn't get any more depressing, the doorway disappeared. And with it, any chance of getting my deputy back was gone. Unlike most towns, Hollow's End doesn't have a hospital or a pharmacy. They have a butcher, who can sew up a knife wound or cut your hair, and an apothecary who is also a tailor. Small towns are like that. People carry two or three different jobs and titles. Sometimes those jobs seem to directly contradict with one another, Jay explained to me. The dentist here runs a candy shop, and the local drug dealer drives an ambulance on weekends. We've got a mortician who moonlights as a yoga teacher, and mailmen who steal UPS packages. Everyone needs a side hustle in this economy. It turns out Muriel was also the 911 operator and dispatcher, as well as answering the phone for the delivery company. And Jay is a certified accountant. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked again. The painkillers do that to me. The point is, they got me and the butcher to the guy who was able to patch us up, and he did a hell of a job. I'm not entirely sure how, but I seem to have a fully functional working leg once again even if it doesn't match my skin color and the stitching is a bit crooked. I'm not one to complain. The whole thing only took about an hour. After that, I got to finish keeping my promise. We let John out in front of his house, and he said his thanks once again, closing the car door and waving goodbye to us. I felt a bit bad I hadn't gotten to know him better. His wife came running out, and they embraced in the driveway. Then she ran over to me, to give me a heartfelt hug. Thank you, she said, tears streaming down her face. Thank you for bringing him back safely. You're more than welcome, I told her. That's what sheriffs do. We serve and protect. She took a look around the car, then her eyes widened. Randy, did he... is he... I cast my eyes downward and shook my head. Randy, Randy was a good deputy. He, uh, he sacrificed himself so that we could... I broke off and heard myself let out a ragged sob. So that we could escape. He saved us, Muriel agreed. He was a good man, in the end, Jay said softly, lowering his head. It was silent for a few moments before the woman spoke again. I'm so sorry, she whispered. Us too. It looked like something occurred to her suddenly. Did you fix it? Whatever was wrong with the town? It feels different, like something changed. We did. Randy did. He must have closed off the portals to the other dimension. People won't be going missing anymore. At least, not any more than usual. Tourists, Muriel said in agreement. They never learn. Okay, sure, but let's pretend I don't know about that. Plausible deniability, I told her. 
we spoke with the couple for a moment longer before I made an excuse to leave. I was tired. Not to mention, talking about Randy was making me sad. I didn't want to think about it anymore. Muriel and Jay dropped me off at my car, and I drove it back to the police station. The new leg worked pretty well, but it would take some getting used to. I nearly rear-ended two different cars and almost ran a red light trying to work the pedals, feeling every loose thread which connected my leg together. Despite everything that had happened, I suppose it was for the best. We had closed the dimensional rifts. We had stopped the invasion of monsters from another dimension. We had eliminated the weird plague that was spreading around town. Sure, we'd lost a good man. But sometimes these things get messy, and as I pushed open the door to the bullpen, I was not entirely surprised to see Randy in his cell, sipping something from my number one sheriff coffee mug. He had his feet up on the bars of the cage, and was reclining on a chair that looked ready to tip over. I felt a single tear run down my cheek, but it was the only one, as my deputy's words made my blood immediately turn cold. Check it out, boss, he said, holding up a fresh monkey paw with four raised fingers. There must be a million of these things in that other world. He tossed me my own personal severed monkey hand. I held it up in the air and stared at it in numb, terrified shock, and then he used his own monkey paw to give mine a very gentle high five. Twinsies! Thanks everyone for listening to tonight's story. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to hear more tales from Hollow's End, you can click the link on the top right of your screen. And there will be a few more stories coming from Hollow's End very soon. Thanks again for listening, and please hit the like button, the subscribe button. And join me every other day at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another horror story narration. Hope you all have a good night.